Bifocal, Chapter 6, Haroon Did we create God, or did God create us? Miss Singh is standing in front of our comparative religions class, her face joyful at presenting us with an unanswerable question. Our desks are in a large circle so that she can see all of us and we can all see each other. How many of you believe that God created us? she asked the class. Many kids raise their hand. Miss Singh has them all go to the end of the room, calling them Group A. How many of you think that we created God? I put my hand up, then take it down, then put it up again, then take it down. Miss Singh sees me. How many of you are not sure? I can certainly raise my hand to that. My family is religious, but we also believe in science. There are a few other hands up in the air. Group A, you will come up together with a list of compelling reasons why Group B is right. Group B, you will do the same to prove Group A's position. Group C, the undecided, you will come up with a list of what makes a religion. You have 15 minutes in your groups, and then we will all come back together and share. Miss Singh does that a lot, gets us to argue someone else's point of view. My group starts off strong, with things like shared philosophy, belief in the supernatural, rituals, organization of behavior. Then someone mentions Jim Jones and the Hare Krishna, and wonders what the difference is between religion and a cult. We try to divide the list between good religion and bad religion. By the time our 15 minutes are up, we are even more confused than when we started, but we have lots to think about. Miss Singh asks me to stay behind for a moment when the class ends. I've been dreading this, but I knew it was coming. With Azim arrested, there is an opening on the team. Jose dropped out, she says. Her mother called me. She's upset that her son was cavorting with a terrorist. That's how she puts it, cavorting with a terrorist. It's not a fair phrase you hear every day. Have you heard what kids are saying, I asked her, about me? She nods. Is it true? What? No! Well then, I hesitate. I hope you won't take this long to answer when you're on television. I'll do it, I say. She smiles. It will be fine, she says. It will be more than fine. We're going to win this year. The bell rings, and I race off to my next class, eager to disappear into the impersonal, non-religious confusion of algebra. Then and I are both in this class. In one way, I'm glad, because she goes over the work with me at home. It's the only way I've managed to maintain a B. On the other hand, having her nearly perfect scores pointed out after every test makes it painfully obvious who is smarter of the two of us. I'm smarter than Xana in some things but not in algebra, or anything that involves that type of puzzle-solving thinking. There are too many threads to keep track of. Xana is like some mad weaver, keeping all the threads in place, pulling them out as she needs them. I suppose my memory is my biggest strength. That's probably why I was the one chosen for the reach for the top team. In class, I sit two rows across and three seats down from her. I can watch the back of her head during a lesson. I can almost see all that data flowing into her brain and linking up with all the other data that's there. Today is mostly review for an upcoming test. Our teacher this year is big on review. It only gets harder, she says. If you miss a step, you'll get lost in the dance. Thanks to Zana's coaching, I'm able to follow today's work. It's even a relief to write figures in my notebook, tidy and clear, to know that there is a right answer, and that I might even be able to find it. The class is concentrating deeply, our heads bent over our books, occasionally glancing at the front as our teacher leads us, almost mantra-like, through the jumble to the clear, logical pattern. The answer is right there, just a few steps away. I know what the steps are, and I know how to do them. I am inches, seconds away from solving the puzzle. And then, the fire alarm goes off. It is so loud and sudden, we all have been so quiet and focused, a few of the kids actually let out little screams. I don't scream, but I do jump in my pen, making a dark, ugly mark through the lovely row of figures. I look down at my notebook in despair. The equation now makes no sense. The threads all dropped and burned. Class, stand. We stand by our desks and row by row file out into the hall. This is not a time for talking, the teacher says, as he heads, herds us down to the nearest staircase. Stay with your class and out in the schoolyard. Of course, none of us does. The language teachers try to continue oral drills outside. We hear chants of Alfanta de pan bueno son las totas coming from the Spanish class and equally useful phrases from the French class. Most of the teachers don't bother trying. We were all told at the beginning of the year that students who don't return to class after a fire drill are marked absent. It saves the teachers trying to chase after escapees. 
Julian finds me. He's in his smock from art class. It's covered with paint. Looks like the real thing, he says, as a fire truck comes up the street and stops in front of the school. Students cheer. Are they cheering because the fire truck is here or because the school is burning down? Police cars follow the fire truck. Look, someone yells, pointing up at the school. Smoke is pouring out of some of the windows. This could take a while, I say to Julian. We make ourselves comfortable on a low wall by the teacher's parking lot. Julian is the type of friend who likes companionable silence as much as good conversation. We've known each other for years. We go on long hikes along the river, sometimes not talking for ages. Then one of us will pull a thought from the air, maybe from a conversation we had weeks ago, and we slide right into it as if there had never been a pause. We watch the police and firefighters run around. After a bit, I get tired of watching them and start watching the students. It's the herd mentality, I say. Deer to deer, goat to goat. Even the teacher animals hang together. It's true. Some teachers are still with their classes, but most are standing around in a lump. Some look like they wish they could smoke, but smoking areas are strictly enforced at our school, and the principal doesn't like teachers to smoke at all in front of students. It isn't universal, but it's clear enough to make a statement. The jocks have drifted to be with other jocks. The rockers are with the other leather and metal kids. The car guys and their girlfriends are draped around each other over by the recycling bins. The Caribbean kids are together. The science fiction kids are together. And the loners are scattered around, trying to look like they don't mind being alone. Remember when we were little kids, Julian asks? A kid was a kid was a kid. When did we start to notice differences, I wonder? That's the real loss of innocence, man. Another cheer goes up. We see a couple of firefighters come out of the building, one holding a smoke bomb. Two cops are suddenly beside me, Detective Moffat and the driver who had talked to me yesterday. The driver speaks in a loud, clear voice. If you knew about this, Haroon, and didn't tell us, we would hold you criminally responsible. They walk away without waiting for my denial. It's just as well, because words are failing me once again. I look at all the faces staring at me, their expressions full of question. I do not know what to say to them. Julian pulls me away, but I can still feel their eyes on me. They're just playing with you, Julian says. Don't let them get to you. I'm about to say something tough and blustery, which neither of us will believe, but will help me pretend to feel better, when Xana appears and says, Can't you ever speak up for yourself? We were allowed back into the school. I feel small and powerless and an outsider among my own classmates.